Hi, my name is Priya and I've been with Carers UK for about a year or so now and I work for, in the community care advice line um, and uh, I guess my experience is that I'm a solicitor in community care and housing and um, I've been a paralegal for about seven years and uh, recently qualified last year so um, I've got quite a bit of experience in supporting disabled adults, children and their carers, quite passionate about it. Um, so I will share my screen. Today I'm going to be talking about disabled facilities grants and aids and adaptations and what you can do to best support the person that you're caring for if that is something that you need. All right, so a disabled facilities grant is it's available from local authorities and it's to pay for essential housing adaptations to help uh, disabled people stay in their own homes. Um, it is a means tested grant and it's for people who have a permanent disability which can be of you know any kind and that includes mental um, physical and learning or sensory impairments <coughs> And so it is, the grant is mandatory. So that means that a local authority has to provide a grant to a person who's met all the required conditions, which I'll go through a bit later in the presentation. So the purpose of a disabled facilities grant is to change the home, to modify it in order to help restore or enable independent living, um, a bit more privacy, a bit more confidence for the, for the actual service user and to help more dignity for the individual and, and the families that they live with. The, the main focus on a grant is to implement a solution to help the person who's living within that environment to use their home more effectively rather than on the actual physical adaptation itself. I think local authorities and <clears throat> Sometimes even service users get bogged down to the actual adaptation, but it's more about trying to find a solution between you both to try and try and, you know, for the service user to be able to live independently in the home. And so that is from the delivering housing adaptation guidance for disabled people. That's the main guidance for when you're having a dispute about this sort of area. There is an eligibility criteria and that is that the person or someone living in the property has to have a disability or a health condition and the person or the person in question has to own the property or be a tenant and they have to intend to live in the property for the grant period. At the moment that's five years, it might change a bit later but at the moment that's the grant period. And landlord can also apply for a grant for a disabled tenant. And the council, in order for it to go ahead, the council does need to be happy that the work is necessary and it's appropriate to meet the disabled person's needs and that it is reasonable and can be done. And that depends on the age and condition of the property. So when you're looking at the, this criteria and if you've been refused a grant, if you're if you're challenging the decision, you have to always come back to this, this criteria and set it out as to how you meet the criteria and ask the council to look at it again. And some arguments you can use is that <coughs> um, it is necessary and appropriate. Like for example, if you need a stair lift for the person to go up and down the stairs safely, or if you already have a stair lift and the, the person is not using the stair lift safely, like for example, if they're just coming out of it or if they're undoing the belt or whatever, it's not no longer safe. So maybe there needs to be a wet room downstairs or there needs to be an extension to a bedroom downstairs. So you need to always sort of um, use arguments that go in your favor. And sometimes medical evidence is always helpful because you'll get, you just need supporting information to support what you're arguing. Um, councils do sometimes use this argument here that it, it can't be done because of the condition of the property and they might suggest that you move home and um, and you can sometimes argue that that's not actually a reasonable 
you know, a decision to make because of the stress it causes to move. And um, sometimes the you some arguments you can also use in this is that that medical services are nearby, they might have a support network on the road that they live on. You know, moving is always quite stressful. So that you can always sort of use different arguments for that as well. So when you are you are given the grant um, money, and I'll go through the amounts in each country in a few more slides, but you can be paid either in installments or as the work as the work is required, or you can be paid in full. Um, the grant sometimes can cover up to 100% of the costs of adapting your home. The quote is usually discussed at the start, and it, it does all, also depend on what your income and savings are. <clears throat> you are sometimes also paid when you when the council is happy that the work is finished or when or when the council when you give the council the invoice from the contractor that you have some councils prefer to use their own contractors i think you you can have up to a maximum of three quotes from different builders and you know you can some councils do allow your own contractors but i think they have to always be within the cost limit so that's always something to discuss with them as well at the start so the main legislation for disabled facilities grants is the housing grants construction and regeneration act and section 23 lists out the purposes for why a grant must be approved and some of the i haven't listed all of them but you can get it from this link here and the main examples are to widen doorways. Um, if you're, if somebody is a permanent wheelchair user or it doesn't have to be a permanent wheelchair user, it can be if they use a wheelchair time to time as well. And uh, making outside steps easier or to use or installing ramps. So it could be handrails as well. Um, installing a stair lift, <clears throat> walk-in shower, rec room, um, improving any heating system to meet the needs of the person as well. Some work can be provided for free, and that is any community care equipment and minor adaptations. And that's where it's for assisting with nursing at home or aiding daily living, which the person has been assessed to need. But that's only if the cost of the equipment and adaptations is less than a thousand pounds. And that sometimes can include ramps some some ramps can you can get that for that under that mount or it could be just handrails or grab rails a lot around the property so in england the grant available is up to 30000 in northern ireland it's up to 25 in wales it's up to 36 um in scotland it's a bit different the sum is discretionary and it it depends on the council you can get advice and information about adaptations in this link here and that will go through what the criteria is it's just slightly different to how the uk and wales do it so the, because the grant is means tested it does take into account household savings but the first six thousand are exempt from the means test and the household income is also taken into account um, the means test does also take into account the finances of the spouse or partner so other members of the house aren't included it's just if you're married or in a in a relationship living together that they'll take that into account um, it's always probably useful to do a, a sort of income and, and expenditure sheet when you're telling the council about your finances because they it's important that they know what your all your incoming and outgoing costs are because you may have a lot of outgoings because of certain um, payments that you have to make that are related to the person's condition as well and that's called disability expenses so it's important that they take into account everything you can sometimes get templates from citizens advice bureau or or online there's loads of templates online that you can always also check out so for children the there is no means test um uh, so they don't take into account um any 
finances for children. But some arguments, there can still be quite a lot of disputes with local authorities when it comes to children and adaptations. And these are just some of the arguments that you can use to support your, your case. Um, so the main section is section 17 for the Children Act. And that places a general duty on local authorities to provide a range of services to safeguard and promote children in need, their welfare. And that duty does also include support for adaptations to a home in order to accommodate the disabled child's needs. So sometimes councils may say, um, you know, you're not eligible for the grant um, you, and you can always just come back and say, well, these are the arguments that we're using and just always apply it to your child's case. Um, there's also another legislation for children, which is the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act. This also applies to adults as well. Um, so this is section two, and that covers the provision of assistance for the child in arranging for carrying out works of adaptations in the home and just to secure the greater safety and comfort and convenience. And that's also a really good argument to use if you're just having a dispute about eligibility. <laughs> so going back to the guidance, so the guidance and the legis these legislations go hand in hand, you can always use them together and um, it's quite a long document but you can, you can I've put, uh, taken out different paragraphs to, to see if the, like the main ones. So Annex C of uh, paragraph 17 states that the facilitating access includes work which are intended to remove or help overcome obstacles to a disabled child moving freely into or around the home and accessing facilities within it. And that can include family rooms, bedrooms and bathrooms. <clears throat> so for example, you might have a dispute over a, an extension for a bedroom to be built downstairs. And the local authority might say that you can use another room within the property and you, obviously you, you'd have to um, give measurements to say that that's not possible, but you can always come back to this argument to say that it, you know, the grant has to be approved to facilitate access around the home, which includes bedrooms. I mean, you can use it with any argument and um, bathrooms as well. If you need a wet room, it, it all depends on what the situation is. So, because disabled facilities grants, they can actually take um, a very long time. Um, it's, you can ask for interim assistance. And so that's under paragraph 7.56 of the guidance that does say that local authorities have to consider um, interim assistance for the person. And because that's only because it's not acceptable that the disabled person and carers should be left for uh, a number of weeks or months without interim help. And that's where the adaptations is likely to be lengthy. Um, disputes over disabled facilities grants can take up to two years sometimes because it takes a long time for it to be approved. And then there's always, um, you know, people going back and forth in with sort of agreeing um, the plans, etc. So it can take a really long time. So interim assistance is always something really useful to ask for because it may be that you can be moved or it may be that you can have some sort of temporary adaptations in place. Um, it, it's not acceptable that someone should live in those conditions for a very long time. It's not acceptable for any, even a week really, but you should, it's always useful to use that argument when you're um, having this sort of dispute. So the guidance also has some useful information about um, people with multiple impairments and deteriorating illnesses and I've just taken bits out of the guidance for you to use and um, so paragraph 7.48 just says that there is a need to consult the person in question, their carers and any specialist colleagues and it's really important when meeting the needs of people who've experienced have various impairments. So it could be someone who has had, has had a stroke and is also, you know, has dementia, 
because it's, it's multiple conditions. So it's important that there's a holistic view taken and, you know, discussions are made with the medical team if, if possible. And also is uh, paragraph 7.32 also with deteriorating illnesses. It, it might be challenging to, <clears throat> to provide adaptations for those people. And so the response for this should be as soon as possible. And you can, if someone is having a, it has got a deteriorating illness, it doesn't mean that they need the adaptations as soon as possible. And, you know, the procedure should be expedited. So when you're making the application, you're saying that these are the illnesses and, um, you know, this is the reason why the application needs to be done as soon as possible and give medical evidence, give supporting letters from the GP if necessary. And I'm just at 7.34 of the guidance that just refers councils to specialist organisations that may have expertise in meeting the needs of disabled people with particular conditions. And so it, you know, the council staff, social workers, managers, whoever they are, they should be encouraged to contact and work with these specialists and make use of their knowledge because council staff aren't medical professionals, so they need to work together to best support the person who's made the application for the grant. Um, I do know some people are a bit hesitant to allow council's consent to speak with medical staff. If there is an issue with trust, then you can ask the council to maybe do it in writing, or you can ask the council to say, can you just tell me what questions you're going to be asking the medical team? So if there are any concerns about consent and, you know, the relationship between you and your medical team, then you can, you can work around that way as well. So to apply, it needs to be done through the local authority. The council will then send an occupational therapist who's also known as an OT to do an assessment and to see what changes are required. Uh, there is usually a, a long waiting list to get an OT assessment so that the individual might want to use a private OT, which would need to be paid for. Um, the cost may be included in the grant application, but don't go through that process unless one, you can afford it and two, um, it has, you know, you have approval from the local authority that they will reimburse you for that cost. Um, having an expert do an assessment can cost up to £700 so make sure that you make the right decision around that. There is an appeals process so if you're unhappy with a decision that's been made by the DFG application or if the application has been refused then you have some options. Um, the first one is you can make a formal complaint using the local authorities complaints procedure it's always best to ask the appeals process and complaints procedure first because there's um, time time deadlines and you, it's good to know what the process is um, when you when you write to them because it may be that they'll acknowledge your complaint within three days or they'll respond in twenty so it's good to know what what you're waiting for. Once you've completed the complaints process. <clears throat> you can then contact the ombudsman that's the local government and social care ombudsman and that's where the internal complaints procedure has been completed and you're you've still not been able to resolve the situation with with the council and so the ombudsman will look at it and then make recommendations the third option is that you can instruct a legal aid solicitor so if the person is eligible for legal aid they can instruct a legal aid community care lawyer to make representations on their behalf and that's if you are eligible for legal aid I would always encourage you to to try this option because it sometimes helps having somebody um, you know speak on your behalf especially if the relationship between you and the local authority is broken down or if you feel that your voice is not really being heard so I'll just talk a little bit more about legal aid. Um, legal aid is available in this area of law, which is called community care. Um, disabled facilities grants disputes are within the scope of legal aid contracts. 
So each legal aid provider will have a contract that they need to go by with the legal aid agency. And this is something that's within scope. Some stuff isn't within scope, but this one is. And so if the service user is eligible, then it's always worth asking, um, you know, to, to say, to consider approaching a solicitor or caseworker. Judicial review can also be considered. Um, this is where there is a procedural error in law. It's a last resort remedy and it's always taken forward um, with advice from a barrister. Um, it can't be taken forward where there's a disagreement of fact, which is sometimes a lot of the cases in community care. Where there is a disagreement of fact, that's where you can use the complaints process and ombudsman. Um, legal aid can also be used to pay for independent expert reports. So before I mentioned that you can get a private expert report um, from an OT, an occupational therapist, where there's a dispute over works to be carried out. So you can always um, use that option as well, because if you've got one report which you don't agree with, you can always get a private report and ask the council to look at it again, because it, it might be that they're completely different. So if the service user is not eligible for a DFD, a Disabled Facilities Grant, because of their financial means or for any other reason, then there are other options. They, um, there's a self-funding home adaptation. You might want to use your income and savings or look into getting a personal loan or to take out an equity release. Um, downsizing, you might decide to move to alternative accommodation um, or there's charitable grants. So you can sometimes apply for grants to cover the cost of the work required. Um, I appreciate some of these options might, might not be the best option to consider, but it, I guess it all depends on the situation for the person and their family. So these are just some other options you can look at. And just some details on how to contact us. You can, this is our helpline number, our email address, and you can also follow us on social media. Ah, so my name's Liz. Um, a little bit about my background. I've been with the Carers UK Advice Line, um, specialising in welfare benefits since 2017. But a little bit about my background before that is um, I've been with Citizens Advice since 2004, working in a variety of different advice roles, not just, sorry, not just covering welfare benefits. So um, I've been in the advice sector for quite a long time. I also have personal experience of being a carer as well. So I really just like to share some of the knowledge that I have um, and to listen to you as well, because I learned so much from, from you carers as well. So this is my presentation. I hope that you can see it. Um, those of you who are familiar with um, being a carer, so when you're a carer, you're providing help and support to a friend, a family member, it could be a spouse, could be a partner, could be a child, could be a neighbour. And one of the biggest inquiry areas we get coming into us on the advice line is I'm providing this care and support to, um, is there any help to me to be recognised as a carer? Now within the welfare benefits system, in order for you to be recognised as a carer, so for example, to be able to claim carer's allowance or have a carer element included in universal credit, or if you're within the universal credit remit, um, so you don't have any um, work-related requirements set upon you, you need to be recognised as a carer. Now, in order for you to be recognised as a carer, now this is a bit, a bit of a caveat here, this is only within welfare benefits system, not in real life, not in the terms of accessing help and support from Carers UK or from um, your local carers centre. Within the welfare benefits system, for you to be recognised as a carer, the person you are providing care and support to has to be in receipt of something called a disability benefit. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes just talking through the three disability benefits that are available. Now, with all disability benefits, OK, they are a pot of money that is set aside that the DWP have that are paid to people if they meet set eligibility criteria. They're tax free. So although if you are in a, 
a position where you pay tax, you do need to declare them, but they don't count. Um, they're non-means tested, and Priya went through a little bit about, so thank you, Priya, um, about the means test. So means test is when we look at income, savings, and capitals you have. They're not based on whether um, you have any other income into your household at all, and they're paid to you whether you work full time, you don't work at all, you work part time. There is no inference about any monies that you have coming in. They are set purely on eligibility criteria. They're paid to a person who has need for help. And this need and help could be in relation to their personal care, making sure they are safe, and in some cases, help getting around. So they're very set. So we've got set criteria. Now, there are three disability benefits. Now, just to make things a little bit more confusing, the welfare benefit system, as you probably know, over the last few years has had a lot of shake up and it's had a lot of change and it has changed a lot. So currently, as it stands, in order for a child to make a claim for a disability benefit, the benefit that they would claim is something called disability living allowance. So this is known as DLA. Now, this change happened probably around about eight years ago when it was decided that this benefit would only be available to people 16 and under. Prior to that, adults could claim disability living allowance. And some adults are still in receipt of disability living allowance, and that's absolutely fine. OK, there's no need for you to change. At some point, the DWP will look at changing you over to um, a different disability benefit. But if you're there and your circumstances haven't changed, there's nothing spoiling, okay? So for new claimants, so new claims are only available to children under the age of 16, and that child must have a need for care, attention or supervision because of a physical or mental health condition, okay? And this is what's really interesting. There doesn't need to be a formal diagnosis. OK, so we have some set criteria and we look at how your child is against these criteria. Now, they must have needed this care, attention or supervision for at least three months and be likely to need care, attention or supervision for a further six months. Now, this is the crux with the child application. They must need substantially more care more attention and more supervision than other children of the same age who do not have a disability or health condition. Okay, and so they look at comparators, and so they have a standard sort of system. You know, at the age of 18 months, you know, it is expected that X will happen. So, for example, my nephew's coming up to 18 months. Uh, sorry, my nephew, my grandchild is coming up to 18 months. Um, and the health visitor is looking to say, you know, is he crawling? Is he walking? Is he toddling? You know, is he lifting things up? You know, that type of thing. So it's not only about developmental problems, but also about the care they need. Now, with all disability benefits, in fact, with all benefits in, in the system, there are things like you must have no immigration conditions attached to your stay in the UK. So this just means that you have something called recourse to public funds, which means that you are accessible and you are able to claim money from the Department of Work and Pensions. So if you have a visa um, attachment to your stay in the UK, for example, and it says no recourse to public funds, then you wouldn't be able to claim this disability benefit. That could be a whole training session on its own, and it's a bit of a common theme. So um, if that is something that applies to you, please do let us know when we can look at what options are available. The child, the child must also meet the resident and present conditions. And so in a nutshell, it means that they're here in the UK and it is envisioned that if the parents are settled in the UK, that they are going to be in the UK as their main home. So it's slightly different for children than it is for adults. There are two components to this benefit. So we've got a care component, which is paid at three rates, depending on what eligibility criteria is met. And so we've got a lower, middle or high rate. Um, there is no lower, age, no lower age limit for claiming. So if a baby's born with significant disabilities or health problems, um, then an application can be made straight away for a care component. But there is a three month qualifying period. 
so payment wouldn't start for three months. So you could claim straight away, um, but you wouldn't receive any money for three months. If your child is terminally ill, as with all disability benefits, there is no qualifying time period. And I've got a little definition about terminally ill later on. For the care component, the weekly payment rates, as you can see, um, 2370, £60 and 89.60 respectively. Remember it's tax free, non means tested, not linked to any other income. Right, this bottom one, the care component can be paid to a child who needs a lot of extra help with personal care, supervision, or if they need watching over. And just remember we're back to, it has to be substantially more help than a child of an equivalent age. There's the mobility component. So this is the second one. And the mobility component can be paid at a lower and higher rate. So in order to qualify, you need to show that your child is unable or virtually unable to walk and has needs substantially more guidance and supervision than a child of the same age. So the lower rate of mobility can be paid to a child from the age of five. It is for children who can walk but need extra guidance or supervision on unfamiliar routes. And the higher rate mobility component can be paid to a child from the age of three. It's for children who are unable or virtually unable to walk or where exertion required to walk could constitute a danger to their life and could lead to serious deterioration. Children can also apply and qualify if they have severe visual impairments, are both deaf and blind or are severely mentally impaired. And one of the things with the mobility component is that um, it can, if you get awarded the high rate mobility component, access a motor, motor, motability vehicle um, for the family to use, um, which can make things so much easier, especially if your child has a lot of equipment that needs to be taken when they travel. So with the mobility component, um, the lower rate is paid at 2370, the higher rate at 6255. And there is a very strict claiming process. You can read more about it on our website. And I wasn't sure how many of us were carers for children. And um, you need to apply um, via telephone for the form. When the form comes, there's a section that you complete about medical conditions, any treatments you're receiving. There's a section that the school can fill in if it's appropriate, if they have one-to-one -one support, the GP, the health professional. Um, and then a decision is made about that. So this is sort of a whistle stop introduction to disability benefits. So this is the one currently that you have to be under 16 to claim, although some adults are on it and that's OK. Once you get to being 16 or over, so when you are over 16, but under state retirement pension age, this is a benefit that was introduced that slotted in between what used to be disability living allowance and attendance allowance. So it was slotted into the middle category. Now with this new benefit, which has replaced disability living allowance for people over 16, you have to satisfy the daily living activity test and or the mobility test. So it's a very different type of benefit you need to satisfy these tests for at least three months and be likely to continue to satisfy the tests for a further nine months. So all in all, you need to have an impact to your life for at least a year, but you can project some of that. So that can be based on prognosis and things like that. Again, you need to be present in Great Britain. You need to be habitually resident in the United Kingdom, Ireland, Channel Islands or the Isle of Man and not subject to immigration control. So this means that you need to show intention that the United Kingdom is going to be your home. You've registered with the doctors, for example, your children are in school. You may be are in employment. OK, so that's your intention. And you have recourse to public funds, which means you are allowed to apply for welfare benefits within our country. Now, with personal independence payment, also known as PIP, which is a little bit easier to say, you have to have been present for at least 104 weeks out of the last 156 weeks. In a nutshell, that's two years out of three years. It doesn't need to be all in one big chunk. You, you are allowed to have traveled out of the country. Now this last clause, this is the one 
that a lot of people fall foul of, especially if maybe you've been living abroad, you're a UK citizen, you can come back to the UK, you can travel in, you have no um, need to demonstrate um, recourse to public funds, but you have to have been here within the last 156 weeks for 104 of them. Two components to PIP. We've got a daily living one. So this is for help with um, personal care, for example, and mobility component. Each component can be paid at either the standard rate. So this is where your ability to carry out daily living or get around is limited by your physical or mental um, health conditions or enhanced rate is where you have severely limitations placed upon your ability to carry out activities because of your long-term health conditions or disabilities. Uh, this is just a slide telling you how much the weekly amounts are. And just remember, tax-free, NODS means tested, um, available to you um, no matter whether you're in work or not. And there is no requirement for you to spend this money on you know getting a carer to come and help you you can if you want you can spend it on taxis you could spend it on um, activities you could spend it on whatever is needed that you will make your life easier okay this is what this money for it's an extra pot of money to help you make your life easier you can spend it how you like now with pip pip gets a little bit more complicated and so to be awarded the daily living component at either the standard rate or the enhanced rate, there is a scoring system. So we have activities. So within the 10 activities, um, they are assessing your ability to prepare food, take nutrition. So being to prepare it, being able to eat it, washing and bathing, for example. Are you able to communicate verbally? Are you able to talk to other people? Can you make budgeting decisions? So we've got 10 activities and within each activity we have a set of scoring points. And the only one thing I would say about PIP is actually this is the one time the welfare benefit system takes into account any aids or adaptations that you have or you use. So for example, if somebody was um, looking at the communicating verbally section, and they use a hearing aid, that would score two points. Okay. Now, one of the things that probably, if there's enough demand for it, could be help in filling out a form or maybe looking at a challenging benefit decision. So you need to score eight points from the 10 activities to be awarded um, the standard rate, and you need to score 12 points to be awarded um, the enhanced rate. Okay, so there are lots of different activities. If we'd had a little bit more time, I would have gone into them in more detail for you, but there is a nice link there to the fact sheet where they're all listed out. Okay. Now for the mobility component, again, we've got these activities. We've got two activities to help you um, assess somebody's ability to um, the mobility component. So the first one is all about planning and following journeys. So they're considering here any barriers that you may face um, in relation to any um, mental health conditions, cognitive impairments or sensitive sensory abilities. So it includes things like environmental factors. So if I just quickly get my list. So things like needs prompting to be able to undertake any journey to avoid overwhelming psychological distress, that would be four points. OK, so we're looking at getting eight points. Um, for the standard and we're getting 12 points for the enhanced. So the other activity list we've got is about your physical ability to move around without severe discomfort such as breathlessness, pain or fatigue. And it isn't just at the time of carrying out said activity. You also have to demonstrate the impact that has later on that day, the next day, you know. So it's quite a wide picture when we're looking at the mobility component. Now the claiming process with PIP. So when this benefit was bought in, it was bought in and it was completely different to anything that had come before it. It's a little bit of amalgamation between some of the benefits that were available. 
So the claiming process starts with a telephone call. Um, you're asked quite a lot of questions at that first point, things like national insurance, health conditions, health professionals that know you well. So it's useful to have that information with you. Um, they will send out a form. Now this form is called a questionnaire and its title is, how does your disability affect you? Big fat chunky form, it goes through every activity, it goes through all of the descriptors and you can find yourself repeating yourself over and over do that. The more information you can put in, um, the more you can refer back to other sections of the form, um, the more supporting evidence you can get from your GP to your prescription lists to a diary um, of maybe help and support you need, or maybe help and support that's provided by a carer. You know, all of this is really valuable um, supporting evidence. I will just put a little proviso. Whenever you send any completed forms, or any supporting evidence to the Department of Work and Pensions. I am not casting aspersions on them at all, but just in case it doesn't happen to be delivered or it gets lost, if you have a copy and you've sent it recorded delivery um, and someone has signed for it at the other end, then you know you've got a very strong argument that any backdating should be to the point of phone call. Now, if you don't have a photocopier, if you don't have a scanner, one of the best ways that I found is actually take photographs, take a photograph of every page. OK, and then that way you've got documentary proof or get your carer or get, in my case, my son to do it. for me. After the form has been sent in, um, there's a medical assessment that takes place. Now, currently, this could be based on the paper form and evidence that's been sent in. It could be carried out over the telephone or it could be in person. Now, the DWP are just starting to lift some of the restrictions on um, medical assessments and how they're being carried out, but they have a huge backlog. So where they can, they're making decisions based on the information you send in and they may ask to talk to you or your representative over the telephone. So that's all about PIP. So we've got from 16 to state retirement age covered. Now, when somebody reaches state retirement age, which as we all know, is a bit of a moving ballpark at the moment, it's around about 66 and maybe nine months now. Um, if you have a need for help with your personal care, the benefit that this person would be needing to claim is one called attendance allowance. So that's what the AA stands for. Um, again, we've got a daily living and mobilities activity test. Now with this one, you only need to have met the criteria for six months. You can make the, client, the claim before the six months are up, but you will not receive any payment until you have. Um, and Common examples we see where people are making these types of claims is where our older loved ones have maybe had a nasty fall and they've broken a hip or they've broken a shoulder and they've been in hospital for maybe, you know, six to eight weeks potentially, then there's been a period of rehabilitation. And then before you know it, we're getting up to 26 weeks. If you know that there's been longer term need and help and support following a fall or an accident, for example, then you can make these claims in advance. Again, we've got the same rules. You've got to be physically here in Great Britain. Um, you have to have a settled intention um, that this is your home if you've just come into the country. Um, and ideally, you need to have been present for at least 104 weeks out of the last 156 weeks within Great Britain. I say ideally, I'll come to that. Two rates of attendance allowance. We only have care that we're taking into consideration here. So we've got a higher rate, which is paid at 89.60, a lower rate paid at 60 pounds. Now it's slightly different the way this is assessed and I'm just gonna put it straight out there. There's no medical assessment, okay, for attendance allowance. It's purely based on the form and the submitted of medical supporting evidence. Now, what we're looking for with um, attendance allowance is a set of criteria. So we have a daytime test and we have a nighttime test. If you satisfy both the daytime test and the nighttime test, you would be eligible to have the higher rate paid. When I say satisfy, that means you need care and support and supervision both through the day 
and at night to make sure that you are safe and you are okay. You would automatically qualify for the higher rate of attendance allowance if you were um, diagnosed as being terminally ill. You will be paid the lower rate of attendance allowance if you only satisfy the daytime test or you only satisfy the nighttime test. Okay? For some people, they need extra help and support through the night. For some people, it's through the day. When it comes to welfare benefits, nighttime is your normal time that you get your house ready, you close it down, you lock the doors, you shut the curtains, you're going to bed. Okay, so for some of us that could be eight o'clock, for some of us that could be 12 o'clock. So for the daytime test, do you satisfy the daytime test? You need to show that you reasonably need, and this is a key thing, so reasonably. Reasonably is that you need that help and support, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you are currently actually receiving it. Okay, so you could have adapted your life to such an extent that actually you don't need any help and support. But when you look at the level of aid and adaptations you've made, so for example, all the clothes that you wear are either Velcro or pull-on or elasticated. You know, you can't do buttons, you can't do shoelaces, you can't do zips up anymore. And so we look at those type of ways that you've adapted and adjusted your life. So you need frequent help with your personal care. So this is about three times a day or more. Um, someone needs to check on you continually to make sure that you are safe. And the nighttime test would be that you reasonably need either one of the following help with personal care at least twice a night or once a night for at least 20 minutes. So this could be um, if you wake up to go to the toilet, for example, the person that you're providing care and support for uh, and they're going to struggle and they need help, you know, getting there, making sure that they're safe, making sure that um, um, they haven't had any accidents, making sure that they're clean, um, making sure that they get back into bed, maybe, you know, tidying up the bedroom area. Um, or if somebody has to check on you at least twice a night, or once a night for at least 20 minutes to make sure that you are safe. Um, you know, make sure that they haven't got out, they haven't wandered off, they haven't got out, for example. So personal care for attendance allowance. So it's things like getting in and out of a chair safely and with reasonable um, support, help with bathing and washing, and that includes things like um, drying, making sure that any health conditions that you have, for example, any ulcerated feet or maybe skin conditions or maybe dressings, you know, are attended to, help with dressing and undressing, including suitable clothes, you know, clothes that are suitable for the environment, making sure you're not going out um, with a vest top and a pair of shorts on when there's six foot of snow outside, you know, thinking about getting in and out of bed safely, making sure that you're sleeping safely, your communication. So are you able to um, express yourself? Are you able to understand? Um, do you need someone to see for you? And now a really common one that can um, really help with things like this is um, whenever they put any of those use by dates on food, they're always really, really tiny. And so we've got use by and we've got best before. Um, and so if you have trouble with your sight, you can't always tell if food is um, still in date. I mean, the more savvy of us, we have the sniff test, don't we? Um, we have a sniff and we can have a look. But if um, our sight is reduced, then, you know, we can't necessarily see how something's looking and we can't see the date. So things like eating and drinking, you know, making sure that the food's cut up. Have you got the strength to cut it up? Do you need special equipment? Breathing, uh, you know, so making sure that if you need oxygen, for example, or nebulizers, any sorts of medication, making sure that if you're breathless, um, you know, that you know how to make sure that person's safe. We've got using the toilet. There's a whole range of things involved with using the toilet. Um, and also walking, moving around. I they only take into account for attendance allowance, and this has been a big bone of contention with me for a lot of years, indoors. OK, nothing to do with outdoors, it's only to do with indoors. So needing to check on you. Um, this is it's a really important one. You know, if you're supporting someone who maybe has memory, memory loss, is maybe unstable on their feet, um, poor awareness of potential dangers, 
um, maybe seizures. And so it's checking on someone regularly. So the checks must be to avoid a substantial danger to yourself or to other people. Okay, so that's a really important thing. It's not just to you, it's about keeping other people safe as well. You'll be pleased to hear the claim process for attendance allowance is so much easier than PIP. Straightforward telephone call, the form is sent out. Complete it again the best that you can, provide any supporting evidence, um, keep a copy, send it recorded delivery, um, no medical assessment for attendance allowance. It is based purely on the information that you send. So it's a nice straightforward one, attendance allowance. I've mentioned a couple of times special rules. Now special rules um, are when somebody has been diagnosed as being terminally ill. And what it can do is it can allow people to get benefit help quickly. It overrides things like the past present test. It overrides things like you must have lived in the country for two years out of the previous three years. Now, within welfare benefits, there's, there's a, an expectation that if somebody receives a terminally ill diagnosis, that they are not expected to live for more than six months. OK, but we know it is impossible to say exactly how long somebody is going to be alive for. So if someone is diagnosed as terminally ill, um, it's always worth just asking the question, you know, would a DS 1500 be appropriate here? The DS 1500 is a form that a medical professional completes and you send it in with your benefit application. It shortens it significantly. There are no medical assessments. You don't need to provide any of the supporting evidence. Um, Macmillan nurses, for example, are really used to filling them in, as are a lot of people within the GP surgery, for example. Now, just because a DS 1500 is issued, that does not mean that if you are still alive after three years, you are still not going to be paid your benefits. You are. OK, it isn't a, you know, a bad thing necessarily. But what a DS 1500 can do is really speed up the process. OK, so it's always worth just asking. It also means that someone else can make the claim on behalf of the person who's poorly because most likelihood, you know, they're going through medical treatment. So don't really want to have to be filling in benefit forms. This last one, um, again, it could be just a whole session in itself, but it's about challenging a benefit decision. So with any benefit application, there is always a decision that comes back. OK, now. There are a lot of reasons you might not be happy with the decision. You might have been refused completely. It might be awarded at a lower rate than you thought it would be. So, for example, you were awarded um, a middle rate care for personal independence payment and you thought actually you should get high rate care because you believed you met the activities to score 12 points. Now, within one card under the date of the letter, you usually must start the process of asking for somebody else, another decision maker, to look at the decision based on the evidence that has been put forward. So this is known as asking for a mandatory reconsideration. There are some circumstances where you can have up to 13 months to ask for a mandatory reconsideration to be looked at again, um, but I would advise getting advice on that because it's quite tricky. Short proviso. By asking to have a decision looked at again. Okay, it could be increased, could stay the same, it could go down, or it could be lost altogether. So it's a bit of a tricky one. So it's about weighing up the pros and cons of what you've been awarded um, against what you feel would have been a more appropriate award. And that's something all welfare benefit advisors are really happy to help you with. Okay.